Great. I'm very happy to introduce our final speaker for today, who is Gregory Breida. He's Assistant Professor of Art History at Barnard College, Columbia University. He specializes in the art of medieval Europe and is particularly interested in medieval science, folklore, environment, and culture. His book, The Trees of the Cross, out in June with Yale University Press, explores the ritual blessings of greenery at the altar and outdoors in late medieval Germany and the liturgical artworks that stage and mediated them. His research into Germany's long historiographic affinity with the forest form part of a collaboration of art historians investigating the representation of environmental politics from the 19th century to the rise of national socialism. Last year, he edited a special issue of Zeitschrift für Kunstgeschichte on art and environment in the Third Reich, whose contributors examined the period's aestheticization of race and landscape across a broad range of disciplines and media. Today, he will be speaking on the vegetable state. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, funnily enough, I opened my mailbox today and <laughs> literally uh, the, um, the advanced copy of my book arrived. Very sorry. I mean, <laughs> I barely, I like hopped in the car to get here right after. I need to bring it with me to look at it. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, Kathleen. Um, I'm so excited to share this. And it's about a very bizarre group of objects that I, for a long time I've tried to put together artwork. So it's really what this talks about like a, a small group, a small group of interrelated, weird, late medieval journey. So it's very specific. So I'll dive right in. Yeah. Okay, great. So my talk uh, today explores the relationship between the true cross, its legendary history, and a category of miraculous carved crucifixes made from trees growing in a German countryside in the 14th century. It seeks to return the local objects to their context of spring rituals, through which they then re the earth. Arising out of miracles rooted in trees and the local landscape, <clears throat> The two crucifixes, two crucifixes that form the heart of my talk, one from the Westphalian village of Lage, the left, the other from the town of Cranenburg, which is near Thebes, were subsequently instrumentalized to empower requests for renewed divine intervention within nature. Far from ordinary, as their surviving histories recount in words, the crucifixes transcended their ontological status as mere images precisely because the miraculous trees from which they derived reenacted many of the key tropes first exemplified by the true cross. Imbued with the mystical qualities of the true cross itself, the crucifixes furnished altars inside their churches, but at pivotal moments in the agricultural and liturgical calendar, they were ritually processed outside its walls to render the surrounding landscape and its vegetation the potential for new divine intercession, which in turn for the people of these towns would ideally result in more wood in the form of crucifixes. In revealing how typologies of the Holy Cross came to punctuate real life medieval German topographies, the talk further shows how the Virgin Mary, on account of her genealogical connection as a rod or virga to cross to Christ and cross, how she also became miraculously manifest in the natural element, and in her case, not only in trees, but also water. Still, for all the power these wooden artworks could claim over the lowly wood of our greenery, their own wood was always carefully partitioned from that of the true cross, capital T C, laying bare the risks and challenges posed by the reincarnations of the cross legends in local landscapes outside the sanctuary. Because of their material and typological linkages with the supernatural trees and waters that produced them, but whose powers they also in turn effectually reinforced, the artworks addressed in this talk inhabit <clears throat> an ambiguous position as objects that exceed representation, but that do not equal the divine vegetable they represent. Lying somewhere between art and relic, they helped enact the link between the cross and the living environment, 
And in doing so, they also provided an outlet for people's anxiety about the fragility of farming and the church's anxiety around inexplicable phenomena occurring in and potentially improper veneration of nature. Ultimately, they demonstrate the existence of a path radiating out of the church and the altar, more specifically, one that absorbed the surrounding land into the orbit of the church, and one that became most apparent with the seasonal celebrations of the cross in May and September. Perhaps because none stands out as particularly technically refined, especially the example from Cranenberg on the right, the artworks addressed tonight have not been given considerable attention by art historians. But once they are put in dialogue with the broader visual culture of the moment and region, they reveal the pervasiveness of the devotion to and religious power of the word of the cross, which the church both harnessed and contained. I will start by focusing on the Laga and Cranenberg crosses. We will witness how they reincarnate the golden legend's life of the cross, and thus also attribute the cross's resilience on its journey through time from paradise to Golgotha, then to Persian hands, and ultimately back to Jerusalem again. How all of that power of the cross um, exists because of the cross's ambivalent materiality. Saintly vegetable is ostensibly earthly, as seen here at the moment at which divine greenery from Eden crosses over into the territory of fallen mankind, our world delivered by the Archangel Michael to Adam's son, Seth. But it is supernaturally resistant to decay, water logging, and even fire. The primordial tree is reworked into beams, but they refuse any architectural arrangement that might compromise their fate for Christ's crucifixion. That is, the divine material of the cross confounds the design of humankind. The otherwise perceptible properties of wood and thus lowly artistic reproduction. The only non-human saint resists being an object. It has behaviors, an ornery personality even, which all underlines the paradox or tension of the sacred but terrestrially familiar true wood. For this reason, when the miraculous crucifixes of wood emerge from trees in the humble towns of Laga and Cranenburg, certain pictorial strategies are deliberately employed to underscore the privileged ontology of true cross relics that were scattered widely about the empire at the time. As the illumination from Catherine of Cleves hours makes plain, the real wood may resemble ordinary wood, but it is indeed shinier, glistening in a league of its own, tripartite foreshadowing its destiny. Repeating many familiar motifs from the legend of the Wood of the Cross, the Laga Cross's origin story, and we'll start with this one and then move to Cranford. That cross's origin story, the one you're seeing here, centers around the local tree from which its forms were carved. This legend, along with an indulgence for pilgrims who travel to the town for the Feast of the Elevation, which is September 14th, that all of that must have stimulated the cult around this carved cross. According to the legend's text, in the year 1300, Rudolf and Johannes, two brothers of the St. John's order, experienced a vision of Christ's cross while on a sunny afternoon stroll through the countryside. A voice called out and commanded them to seek wood, to fabricate a replica with the image of Christ, to, and to erect it in Laga's church of St. John. Taking their time to scrutinize the surrounding grounds, they finally settled on a unique tree in the district of Riest, which was on the border of yards belonging to two different men, and these are great old German words, uh, old German names, Sube and Wunderwinkel. Sprouting red leaves of no apparent earthly species, the tree pleased them in the end because its inner wood quite resembled that of an oak. Having stripped the trunk of its branches, however, the two, Rudolf and Johannes, were unable to fell it on their own. They were only successful after Hundewinkel converted to believe their story and loaned them his horses. That is, the tree only submitted once it gained another convert. Once the men installed the completed sculpture in the church, it performed miracles for centuries thereafter for the sick, 
who prayed to it or paid homage to the stump of the once living tree that gave way to the crucifix's wooden core. Its cult therefore revolved around a reciprocal performative exchange between the object in the church and the place where the stump stood in the Sinatra landscape. We'll see how that is important later. The Laga legend and its insistence on the discerning eyes of Rudolf and Johannes, which is a persistent topos from the golden legend exhibited by the Empress Helena and the Queen of Sheba before her, seem to bear out metaphysical evidence. In reference to the cross fixture itself, the wooden selection must have been made with great knowledge and care, for the exceedingly long upright post exhibits no signs of curvature or twisting, despite the centuries long duress of carrying the crossbar and cross its heavy wooden corpus. That's fair, that's very right. Consistent with these legendary texts and with the species indigeneity to Westphalia, the boards each comprise one quarter of an oak's trunk. While the specific year 1300 is unlikely, stylistic analysis and the historical record point to the sculpture's production within the first few decades of the 14th century. Integral to the legend of the large cross and that of the true cross is not only the find, but also the bringing down and the miraculous transformation of the tree into a carved crucifix. Instead of the organic curves of fork shaped crosses, like an archetype from Cologne that I'll show later. This one is not fork shaped, but is distinctively has a distinctive, distinctly carpentered aspect that is manifest in its branchy but unusually shaped beams, which are evenly planed, like flattened out and shaven to form octagonal locks. First, much in the way that King Solomon's laborers encountered trouble when attempting to integrate the cross's wood into Solomon's temple. The two Johannite brothers, enlisting help from Hundewinkel and his horses, required disproportionate force to fell the ornery Laga oak. The Solomon motif is not only unique to Laga. It also plays out in the story of the founding of the Church of the Divine Savior in the Flemish Brabant town of Hackendover. Carved into its three virgins readable, two men chop at the base of a hawthorn in vain, for, as the story goes, it will necessitate the power of 12 to cut down the tree, which an angel had marked the people of Hackendover as the spot for their new church. As opposed to Hackendover's altarpiece, which contains a mere representation of the miraculous tree at the center of that church's temple, the Laga cross notably preserve the preserves the sacred tree's wood as the work of art itself. To assure the wood's holy status was not compromised in the process, the legend insists the images fractured defied or at least eluded handiwork. Once their divine mandate is clear, Rudolf panics, professing to his brother that neither possesses any knowledge in woodworking. Johannes reaffirms, exclaiming, quote, the one thing is true. I have never had the tiniest skill to make or complete something out of wood, much less something as beautifully honor and honorable as the image of Christ on the cross. Yet, Brother Johannes died happily once he realized all but Christ's left arm, which once bro Brother Rudolf finishes, also comes to pass. Right. Ultimately, the brothers' hands become willful instruments of God's artistic expression, as the voice from their vision, vision had foretold their peaceful death once the work was complete. What sets the story in motion in the first place, though, was the vision of the true cross, the ur wood an unicum that inherently cannot be reproduced. To draw on its potent originary status, as well as the tradition in the golden legend by which it traveled across space and time, particles of the true word wood were ensconced inside this crucifix. But as was the case for all of this genre of so-called doleful crucifixes, across Germany, when the physical traces of the original cross are inserted inside them, they were housed exclusively in the body of Christ, either in his cranial or chest cavity, along with other relics, rather than the carved branch-like crosses that represented them in vigorous arboreal language. To have stored two cross relics in cross-formed containers was far from unprecedented, 
as the golden and silver gemmed cross uh, reliquaries from earlier in the Middle Ages demonstrate. Jewels were better at approximating the divinity of the true cross, whereas wood carved to simulate a gnarly tree, especially in light of its miraculous actions, stood at greater risk of idolatrously reinstating the true cross. That is, problems of potential slippage seem to have come about when reliquaries began to share an apprehensible iconic and substantial likeness with the cross relics they contain. Indeed, the relics lodged inside the carved branched crucifixes are often referred to in inventories or uh, labels, authentics, as quote, the wood of the Lord. Materially similar to the carved oak in which they are encased, the wooden fragments labeled as such rise above metaphor and artifice as ontological equals with the cross, but not without asserting the material kinship with earthly timber too. While in the case of Laga, the fragments call to mind the local tree where the cross's legend was miraculously rehearsed in the German landscape, even drawing a material connection to it, it is nevertheless the representation of the body of Christ that is privileged to house them. Capital WZ, wooden cross, and lowercase wooden cross, despite the latter being made of a special or supernatural wood, are tellingly separated in Waga, as they are in all the crucifixes of this genre. A deliberate decision that takes its most pronounced expression in the case at Prannenberg. On the other side of the Rhine from Westphalian Lager, the miraculous wooden crucifix of Cranenberg from the Thieves stands as another reinstantiation of the golden legend in the local German landscape. Like the Lager cross, its performative efficacy is predicated on its woodiness, but certain pictorial strategies are deployed to delineate, again, between supernatural wood and true wood, the cross wood. The local legend is carried down thanks to Johannes von Wanre, who was a deacon of Cranenberg Church in the early 17th century, who transcribed the legend uh, from a now lost original of 1308. The same year, an indulgence from the Bishop of Utrecht um, issued to visitors an indulgence uh, from the Cranenberg Church. The legend traces the beginning of this cross, Cranenberg Cross, to a nameless shepherd from the nearby village of Neuenburg. Conforming to church rules, the shepherd took the sacrament at Easter Mass, but for an unknown reason, was unable to eat it. Instead, he held it in his mouth until he re returned to his sheep in the forest. There, he climbed up a tree and stashed the wafer, quote, between two branches, effectively planting the body of Christ on a tree cross and foreshadowing the story's climactic end. Overcome with regret, the shepherd subsequently confessed to Heinrich the priest in Cranenburg, who at once took to the forest with a monstrance to fetch and secure the consecrated bread, but to no avail. As Heinrich uh, the priest went to touch the host, it, quote, sank into the tree so that he no longer. To repent, Heinrich scales back down to earth and on bended knee, facing the sight of the disappearance, pleads to God to help him, help keep him alive long enough to see what God has in store for the host embedded tree. Heinrich is thus a cipher both for the Queen of Sheba, who foresaw the sacrality of the holy timber before it took the form of the cross, as well as Helena, Helena, who exalted and knelt before the wooden beings that once carried Christ's body. God grants Heinrich the priest his wish, and 28 years later, the tree brings to bear its miraculous fruit. Unbeknownst to them, Later on, when the priest Heinrich sent a sexton of Cranenberg's church named Meyerich to fell a tree in the forest for Christmas firewood, Meyerich was guided by the invisible hand of God to chop down the one that absorbed the host. He brought the host of the tree to the churchyard, but because the tree was so large, only small portions of it were burned on Christmas. A large piece of it remained, according to the legend, hearkening the figurative triumph of the cross over fire from the golden legend account. It was only months later, on the Wednesday before Palm Sunday, 
when Meyerich was supposed to cut what was left of the tree into smaller pieces, that he witnessed an amazing transformation. The resurrection of Christ's Eucharistic body in the season of Easter, quote, as he hacked the tree, it split in two, from which emerged the holy cross in form and manner, just as it is, as it is seen that, um, nowadays. And never did a knife or tool for carving or working ever make contact with it. And it grew and sprouted out of the same tree in which the holy sacrament had sunk. End quote. The artwork emerged from the part of the tree that fused with Christ's body. On the one hand, the Cranenberg legend follows the formula of late medieval host desecration narratives in which the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist is proven by its miraculous resilience to a range of hazards, mostly pernicious intent, as opposed to the wafer that bleeds, as is often the case with abuses committed by Jews, the piece of Christ's body that the shepherd, the shepherd negligently hid between two branches, which Heinrich sought to secure in a monstrance, fused with the tree, and after growing for 28 years, miraculously mutated into a carved image of the crucified God. The consecrated wafer equals God, who according to the story, quote, did not want his body to lie in vain without exaltation of the tree. On the other hand, the tale from Cranenberg, like the one we heard about from Laga, builds off the archetypal ancestry of the tree cross, but with very important modifications. In a multi-episodic narrative, the holy root, whose destiny is preordained by God, avoids obstacles to arrive at the exact opportune moment in the spring, just before Holy Week, at the time of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. Its inception is reminiscent of Seth receiving and planting the divine sprig over Adam's grave, which would grow into the tree, yielding the real wood of the cross. At Cranenburg, though, the story and resultant artwork stress the role of the transubstantiated body of Christ that Heinrich tucked into the local tree and that miraculously merged with it. Is, it is what is described in the legend as the, uh, quote, holy cadaver in the tree that spurs on the miracle in this variation of the golden legend. The wooden carving, still regarded as the original, indeed depicts only the Corpus Christi. The cross is left implicit thanks to the form and material Christ's body assumes. It is more aptly a semi crucifix Its appearance more or less comports with that laid out in the legend, quote, so the host metamorphosed into an image and figure with its head bowed, arms outstretched and feet atop one another. It also resembles the artwork that a pilgrim drew in 1745, cross to which the corpus is tied in the drawing is likely not original to it and is no longer extant. Whereas God intervened to guide the unskilled Johannite brothers from Laga, the Cranenberg crucifix grows organically out of the tree without the aid of carving tools, but quote, through the holiness and power of the sacrament. The Cranenberg cross is thus an arboreal acheropoeton, a portrait formed after Christ's humanity humbly hewn in reduced forms to efface creaturely authorship. Although it bears no visible trace of the host, it derives from the section of the forest tree into which the Eucharist sank. The wood and the forms carved into it are thus ontologically imbued with Christ's real presence. The tree is thus a vehicle or means whose woodenness is fundamental to the artwork's origin story and its ritual use but it is also an accident, like the bread of the host or the wine uh, of the liturgical wine. The artwork's ontological emphasis remains on the real presence of Christ over that of the true cross, hence the deliberate omission of the cross armature for fear of asserting a dangerous material contiguity again between uppercase wooden cross and lowercase wooden cross. The alternative would have presented the viewer with what Louis Mirat and the German media um, theorist Bernhard Siegard have called excessive mimesis, a mode of representation like trompe l'oeil that overshoots its own target. The ambiguity between miraculous wood and real wood, relic wood, would have been a bridge too far, potentially tricking the viewer like trompe l'oeil, deceiving them into seeing something in the cross 
carved miraculously without human hands that was not really there. The Laga and Cranenberg carvings demonstrate the church's efforts to manage carefully the potential for saintly wood to appear in natural or even supernatural wood. Although they reinstate its legend, the reproductions of the cross are delimited from the true cross itself. Given their pecu uh, peculiar provenance, one is tempted to postulate they came into existence to stave off or direct into more acceptable Christian terms, lingering heterodox attitudes towards animacy in nature. Regardless, the artworks both foreground their origins from local trees, which in both legends were fully chopped down and eliminated so that they could not remain for veneration. But the miraculous carvings from their wood and the bald stumps that indexed their locations did. The opportunity to reunite the two in the absence of their originary trees enabled the church to establish ritualistically the hierarchy of divine wood over the lowly wood, and just as importantly, to contain one away from the other. Along the way, as the crosses still are and were processed from inside the sanctuary to their stations of supernatural creation and back, the wooden crucifixes functioned to bless the fields and vegetation outside the city walls with the miraculous aura in the liturgical seasons of cross, like for the May and September cross holidays and the rogation processions of the cross week in the Feast of the Ascension in the late spring. Okay, so now I want to pivot to explore how the Christ, how Christ's mother Mary was incorporated into the cross's legendary history. As the sock or virga from which Christ sprang forth into the earth, into forth into the world, the Virgin Mary was also entangled in the miraculous manifest, manifestations of sacred wood in medieval Germany. By this time, Christ's family tree, the tree of Jesse had grown out of the realm of scriptural, scriptural prophecy, becoming an autonomous arboreal entity unto itself and assuming efficacious qualities that were interchangeable with those of the wood of the cross. While there are countless religious figures uh, with ties to nature, it is in the ways the virgin body came to be implanted in real space in the landscape, particularly over special trees, that the resonances between her as rod and the wood of the cross become clear. Like the A4 discussed miraculous uh, carved crucifixes, the following, following Marian artworks in the very rear demonstrate a move from the legendary to the contemporary. From the altar and through the medium of wood, they sought to intercede with site-specific natural phenomena, in this case, local weather as well as miracle working waters. Favorite iconography among master glaziers and later illuminators. Jesse trees populated cathedral windows and manuscript pages throughout Europe, visualizing the roots of the church and the genealogy of Christ, starting with Jesse of Bethlehem, continuing all the way to Mary. In late medieval Germany, Jesse trees came into renewed fashion alongside and in conjunction with the cross's legendary arboreal history, enfolding the virgin's body into it. A family of pictures of the so-called tree of the virgin, the arbor of their guineas, abbreviates the tree of Jesse to underscore the blurring together of the Holy Cross's lineage and the genealogical tree of Christ's ancestry. A South German woodcut and a painted panel from the wings of an altarpiece from a Cistercian convent play on the idea of the virgin as virga, meaning trunk or rod. For grounding Mary's parents, Joachim and Anna, as you see here in solemn prayer, the pictures affirm that physical and spiritual contemplation rooted in the heart flowers into an ardent compassion with the ultimate sacrifice of Christ and his mother, his co-redeemer, the trunk of his branches, who suffered as he did at the foot of the cross. Where in some pictures, the filial tree sometimes loops around a central virgin child, like in this 15th century Bavarian manuscript. In many, it penetrates through the virgin's upright body, ramifying out of her heart and bifurcating into the two branches from which Christ came. 
they concretize these arboreal metaphors of her immaculate stock and scion. But they also incorporate Mary structurally into the history of the Tree of the Cross. A woodcut from a printed Swabian volume from 1482 contains a copy of the so-called spiritual maypole, which is a devotional treatise reveling in the vegetal qualities of the cross, and it lays it over the actual May Day maypole that people would decorate and dance around. This woodcut um, uh, portrays a slight variation of the Tree of the Virgin, springing from the uh, recumbent patriarch, a tiny two-branched sapling houses two Old Testament forebears in both of its root offshoots. At the top center, where they cross, we see not Christ, but a bust of Mary, crowning the arboreal cruciform that lurks not so subtly behind the iconographic shadows here. A corollary to her as tree is Mary as life-giving water. Countless springs and wells throughout medieval Germany that were credited with healing powers were named in her honor. The topos was so prevalent that Matthias Gunewald painted Mary perched on the edge of an empty water cistern as a central panel of an altarpiece he commissioned for a, a canon of Aschaffenburg. Their source of moisture dried up. The plants are nourished instead from Mary and Christ's dominating presence as personified fountains. A double rainbow appears in the illuminated mist above their bodies. But Mary's seated posture also echoes the subtle curves of the prominent pomegranate tree spanning the height of the panel. Water and wood are mutually reinforcing horticultural themes that here conjure up their typological antecedents in the tree and fountain of life in paradise. Just as Christ and Mary are positioned as the new Adam and Eve, the tree springing from the wall before this Alvashian landscape points to the new tree of life, the Holy Cross which traversed out of paradise and into the here and now. Indeed, a primary instance of miraculous water on this, on our fallen side of paradise's walls, occurs in the cross's hagiography. And it is the holy wood that infuses the water with its restorative properties. After Solomon's meeting with the Queen of Sheba, he casts the wood into a ditch, which wells up into a miraculous pool that we see in the Probotica. Imbued with the wood's aura, the pool becomes renowned for curing the sick. Resisting rot for generations, the wood floats above the water at the fortuitous moment of Christ's passion. One punitive case that I know of, a carved crucifix reinstantiates this particular episode of the cross's legend in the local German landscape. Part of a large family of forked crucifixes emanating out of the Rhineland in the early 1300s, this oak crucifix from the Westphalian city of Haltern was purportedly fished out of the Lippa River and brought into the parish church of St. Sixtus after residents discovered it miraculously was swimming against the river's current. Um, until 1570, uh, 1570, actually, the Lippa River coursed directly under the church that housed the crucifix. You know, the, 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 the church built the top was designed to do that. The genealogical, arboreal, and aquatic themes of the cross legend all intersect and come to life at the altars of two so-called fountain churches located in Germany's Odenwald, a tract of forested low, fount uh, low mountains in Western Germany. Their place names bearing witness to the natural resource that attracted pilgrims to their doorsteps for centuries, the chapels at Amorsbrunn and Schulenbach were de uh, designed to integrate healing springs into their floor plans. Although Schoenlenbach's church has since been reduced and modified, its late medieval footprint resembled that of Amarsbrunn, where today visitors can still experience the chapel's orientation to the stream coursing beneath it. A hatch opens up from the chapel's floor directly, leading directly to the water, whose curative properties have been appreciated since at least the 11th century, if not earlier, before the arrival of Christianity. There are two of a number of such fountain churches in the Odenwald, but unlike the others, the late medieval redibles fastened to their high altars survive. Both are astonishing works of carving that are unparalleled in their foregrounding of the materiality of wood in their monumental portrayal in the city of Jesse. Because of its grander size, scholars assume uh, that the Schulenbach altarpiece on the left was completed before that on the right in Amorsbrunn. 
uh, in the year shortly following the marriage, the marriage of its patrons in 1503. In fact, if you were standing in front of the Schoenbach altarpiece, your head would be like just at the, the second, the, the first register of figures at the bottom of the tree. It is massive, it is huge. Um, their identical subject matter and idiosyncratic manner of its representation speak to their shared function of not only staging the Eucharist, but also signposting the miracle springs in their immediate vicinity. Indeed, their contiguity with their physical environs seemingly sprouting out of the water below them is thematized by the unusual but calculated uh, decision to preserve the wholeness of the Jesse tree itself. Untruncated, it traverses from Jesse's abdomen in the predella, which is the bottom part of the altarpiece, through a hole in the cabinet's floorboard, self-consciously defying the conventional compartmentalizations of a typical German winged altarpiece. In both cases, According to conservative reports, the tree is hardly worked with a knife, flat across one plane, but divaricating out and upwards to illustrate the schematic ancestry of Christ and his mother. Both trees maintain their physical integrity as singular bodies of wood. Rather than carving and joining multiple pieces, the Jesse trees themselves must have been espaliered or tamed into appropriate shapes ahead of time while they were still alive or at least constructed so as to give that impression. This is an escalator tree from the Cloisters Museum that many of you might even know. Taken out of the world, the Jesse trees are reworked and silvered or adorned with gilded flourishes to become extraordinary trees on the altar table. The conceit of both ensembles in Schoenbach and Amorsbrunn is unmistakable. The Holy Springs produce healing effects because they are brought into the physical orbit of the church and its altar. And given the very deliberate programs decorating it through the roots of Christ's Marian lineage in the tree of Jesse, itself a type for the wood of the cross and the tree of life, which sprung in paradise from the stream of living water. More than as symbols, the typologies here became pretexts for the recurrence of biblical and legendary miracles that are made ever present in the medieval contemporary in the Odenwald as healing springs through the material of wood. Independent from water and typologies associated with the fountain of life, there are countless examples in medieval Germany of miraculous wooden Marian images produced out of or in immediate proximity to trees. In the early Middle Ages, they often functioned as the pretext for church and monastery construction in rural areas. In the later Middle Ages, they stimulated pilgrimage activity. Two of many tree-centered Marian cults in late medieval Germany stand out for the documentation in the historical record and because the wood sculptures around which their, um, their legends are oriented still exist. The town of Hessenthal takes its name from the hazelnut bush, forming the heart of a legend around a miraculous statue of Mary. Skeptical of miracles, as the legend goes, a knight stabbed the bush, which then bled and yielded the carving of Mary holding the deposed Christ. A miraculous Marian statue also attracted pilgrims to the Franconian town of Schneeberg, where in 1470, they were granted indulgences for paying homage to the so-called mother of God on the mulberry tree. A very famous uh, miracle working Marian statue of wood in Saxony, which has unfortunately gone lost, drew the ire of Martin Luther in his table talks in 1525. The Antonine Church of Our Lady in the village of Eiche was constructed in the place where in the 1440s, the Virgin manifested herself on an oak as the place named Eiche suggests, and came to the aid of a cart driver who was stuck in the mud. The oak tree and its accompanying Marian picture, neither of which survived, unfortunately, elicited religious fervor, both, fervor, both from pilgrims in various church communities in Saxon. As early as 1403, priests from all the surrounding villages, some traveling up seven or eight miles were leading processions on the feast of John the Baptist, which is in midsummer in June, to pay homage to Our Lady of the Oak of Ike, to specifically, from the record, avert a bad harvest that was expected due to drought that year. Mary's body as the trunk from which Christ bloomed, much like the innumerable meteorological processions done in May in honor of the same cross, was seen to govern the tempo of the seasons and to restore their natural flow when they were disrupted. 
Hence the coordination of the Ica processions with St. John's Day, the longest day of the year, a felicitous moment on which to conjure Mary's influence over the landscape. Marian liturgical rituals in Saxony and almost certainly in other locations around Germany wound their way from the church to rural outdoor sites where the Virgin had intervened with the natural wood in the past. Drawing from the aura of honorific trees and often the aura from their attendant wooden images through which her visions occurred or which her visions left behind, the processions were carried out, indeed went through great, literal great lengths, eight miles, to beckon through the medium of wood her continued propitious intercession to secure the healthy growth of greenery. Indeed, in bearing such resemblance to the arboreal and horticultural themes more commonly associated with those of the cross, the aforementioned Marian examples testify to how deeply entwined she and tropes of her genealogical ancestry were to cross rituals and artworks, to trees rooted in the ground and installed in altars at the center of sanctuaries. Similarly, while the Lager and Cranenberg crosses appear to us first as representational object, objects, in their mimicry of the legend of the Holy Cross, they become something exceeding representation. Bonded to the true cross through their material and their narrative resemblance to the legend, which also allows them to activate their surrounding landscape, they create a connection to living and miraculous trees in a way that no regular representation could have done. Likewise, artists for the fountain churches at Schoenbach and Amagbrunn deliberately enshrined trees in all their wholeness as a means to materialize what would have been recognizable typological overlaps between the tree of Jesse, the tree of life, the fountain of life, and the Holy Cross. Miraculous trees or curative waters existing in the world were enfolded into churches, were enfolded into the church and either demarcated by the altar and its readable decoration, as in the fountain churches, or they were brought into the church themselves to furnish the altar mensa or to flow directly below it. What we encounter, therefore, is a reciprocal relationship between sacred or miraculous wood and the actual landscape, whereby each feeds the other's sacred potential. But it is a relationship that necessarily ends at the altar table. The artworks discussed in this paper draw together biblical time and the present, allowing the former to be reborn in the latter. That this happens seasonally allows drawing on that sacred potential when it is most needed at the time of fertility and of the risk that that fertility is cut off by bad weather. What the artworks all express is more than symbolic and rather a mode of image making that reveals a densely layered religious meaning in the lived environment through a single material. Wood. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Oh, so much here to absorb. I help me figure. I'm confused about the whole Jesse tree because I've never seen it depicted that way. It, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but my recollection of Matthew's genealogy of Jesus, beginning of Matthew, has Joseph as the descendant of the Davidic line and not Mary. If I remember, which is already, I was, I've always been confused since he was not the spiritual father of Jesus anyway, right? Yes, he did not impregnate Mary with Jesus. Okay, so his genealogy, I don't even know why it's relevant. And I'm, I, I have to say that uh, I'm more taken by all these messianic mothers, right? Going back to Tamar and Ruth and Rahab, which he adds, which is a nice midrash, and Bathsheba. So uh, it's Mary on the tree of Jesse. So, yeah, but they said, uh, is that? That's either a, either I don't remember Matthew correctly, or that's a very uh, creative midrash. It's the Virgin. It's Mary who is 
it's not Joseph. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Listen, thank you very much. That paper was like really great. <laughs> really, I was on the edge of the chair. <laughs> no, seriously, because it was, uh, I mean, not only was it really nicely put together, but that you are. Um, and I think that there was something I was thinking about during the whole time is the, is the, the similarity, not in terms of the material, but the similarity in terms of form um, of the wood. And what happens in the 19th century in Celtic, um, you know, and especially in Brittany, where you have really rough kind of, you know, images of biblical figures, but also um, these, you know, miraculous waters, everything, you know, all of the things that are happening here that are going to guarantee your salvation and guarantee your crops and your fertility, and so all of that kind of, you know, except that there isn't, you know, the wood of the cross or anything like this. I'm just wondering whether the whether the form itself has some, at least in, in the French context later in the 19th century, whether the form itself has some resonance there. Yeah. No, it's it's just uh, it's local uh, Breton sculpture. Yeah, popular. It's mostly. It, it goes back to the medieval period, but you know, it's the the stone and the really kind of rough um, texture and you know, everything in those churches is very very rough and messy. And I just thought that form was, uh, you know, was just something really resonant because you can't get really pieces of a tree cross there. <laughs> right, right. I think about that idea that the, the roughness and the like plastic, even yeah, the, exactly. Like, but um i think i think that not is here's how it's that yeah, right it, the magic is the um the the tide and anchor and the like tradition which i think thinking of medieval christianity Religions is like syncretistic, weird nature. Like, you know, oh, it's like the EPP. Like, well, no, it's just the. No, in, 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 in French, it would be EP. <laughs> right, exactly. And so I think that's definitely um, yeah. a similarity there. It's just, I mean, this is all like red. You want to restore that cross and tree and see us around. But that rawness, that like, it's so, it's the evocative of apocalypse. You need some kind of beauty. But what I think is interesting about your statement too is that the, the, the popular religion of the 19th century is exactly what the folk folk is into. Right. And then the folk folk studies come about to determine what real French, not folk, but a real French person is. This is what women worship. But the information states come together, and that's exactly the kind of stuff that the National Socialists co opt when they're trying yeah. to determine what you know, like a, a real connection to German policy looks like. If it happened during the Middle Ages, and it had to be before that, when the Christians were just working on something that existed before the arrival of Christianity, you know, the blood and soil ideology. Right, right, right. Right, and then there's these French kind of Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that was very, uh, it's just really interesting because. Oh, no. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Jeff. No, I just thought what you were saying was just, just so, you know, resonant with what I was thinking. And now I feel like, you know, dropping everything and going back and doing research on France. Thank you. Slip in a quick question. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask um, I was, you emphasized the golden legend, and I was surprised to not hear. Franciscans mentioned. So I was just curious uh, how you see the role of the Franciscan context, especially in connection to Andrea's paper. And then more specifically, I was wondering what you thought about Franciscan preaching in the 15th century that emphasized this idea that Mary was already created before creation itself, but she was like the prime matter. 
um, because seeing her transformed into a tree, right? I mean, that there's a kind of logic there, right? Yeah, so I'm aware of it, especially from like 15th century Italian preaching. So just curious if you've seen that in Germany as well. And let me actually hand you the microphone. But so Franciscan generally first, what, yeah. The second question I have literally no, I can't respond, but that is no indication of like a lack of complete fascination and curiosity. I want to hear more about Mary and Prime Matter and Silva. I, don't, I literally never come across that. Franciscans come in to this, to my research in a, a massive and profound way. The effect of the tree of life, the um, um, arbor vitae, but also um, the influence that that tract has in the 15th century is massive. I mean, they take various um, Franciscans and some Dominicans actually take that as a source of inspiration to build on the idea of the tree of life and make it uh, just, they, they, they kind of stretch, they make it an uber extended metaphor that the, the blood out of the tree itself equals Christ's blood. The resin and blood are the same, like like individual species. They, they, they also take, they extend the, the vitis mystica, the, the wine, the mystical vine that the pseudo Bonaventure wrote like 10 or 20 years later. And Christ isn't just the vine or the, wa uh, or the wine, but also the original vine, the alder pole it's posted to. We all know the, um, the wine press, but also the barrel, the, um, the cart, the cart rights, the hoist, like literally. So it's, this, this idea of allegory that we were talking about earlier um, in the 15th century, because of the Franciscan movement, it becomes so stretched out as to be almost literal. And then and basically any, any wooden instrument, because it's not just a plant that, was, that the cross, because it's wood, is implanted over. It's any wooden contraption that is used to convert that plant into a... a usable good, not just wine, but cheese, like a wooden cheese strainer was compared to the cross. And his, um, that was written by a Franciscan named uh, Stefan Friedelin. And the loincloth is the cheesecloth. And look, like literally like all of it, and it's, it dovetails with, in the 15th century, an explosion because of the printing press, a common interest, a, a, an explosion of um, uh, manuals on resource management that regular everyday people become kind of interested in. Uh, Pietro de Crescenzi's um, Commodia Ruralia, like every, everyone's just learning about natural resources and how to actually farm, even though they're not farmers. And because of that, then like the cross has to be, it's, it's, it's the plant, but it's also the contraption. It's this key to unlock the mysteries of the faith, but also the natural world. And it's all because of Bonaventure, truly. Additional questions? If, if not, we can go ahead and conclude for today and we'll begin again tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. with our talk by Christiana Gruber. Thank you, everyone.